Hi, I hope you're doing well. Today I want to talk with you about a difficult article, uh, Body, Image, and Affect in Consumer Culture. There are different ways of thinking about how to read uh, and what are the hallmarks of a, a good writer. Some people believe that things should be written in a way that's very clear and everyone can understand. Other people think that to some extent that oversimplifies the world. And some say, oh, it's the burden of the writer to communicate at the level of the reader. Other people say that it's the burden of the reader to rise up to the level of an author or a writer to try to grapple with new ideas and concepts that they currently as yet can't understand, but that that hard work will open up a new way of understanding the world. And I give you this article in the spirit of the latter, that you can read through it, and I know it's difficult, I know there's a lot there, and perhaps even terms of words that you'll need to look up and think about, but in the spirit, again, of growth and trying to realize, too, that theory can be very, very abstract and hard. I had a professor who once said, when you take on contemporary social theory, for sure, you lose your voice lose your ability to communicate about things until you learn a new language. She said uh, learning social theory is like learning a new language. Okay, so in this piece, one of the things I like about it is that those terms that are in the title are very important and you could say um, grounding points to understanding as well as you can the rest of the article. So briefly to go through some of them. Body in this context refers to a physical body. Image has so many different possible ways of, of thinking about it. All right? Just a few here. Uh, you could have a reproduction or an imitation. Right? That can be an image. Visual representation, I think most people think of with image. An exact likeness. Okay. Uh, an illusion. Okay mental pictures, a mental concept held by a group, and a conception promoted through mass media. So image is a very abstract and complex thing. Body image isn't in the title, but it's important for the article. You can think it's a mental image of one's body as it appears to others. So, for example, some people have a positive body image, some people have a negative body image. Some people say, oh, I look fat, and that's how they think of their body, their body image. Body schema is also unique. The way the body is felt, and so your body schema is potentially very different from your body image. Here's a weird example. People who have had a limb uh, that's been uh, removed, okay? They may have phantom feelings in their limb that extend beyond uh, the point where, for example, they lost their leg. And so that's part of the body schema. The body itself is different from the mental way that someone might experience their body, okay? Affect is having, it says there, an influence on or to affect a change. It can also mean to impress on the mind or move the feelings of. And I think of affect as really directly related to feeling. Okay, How um, if someone uh, cries, for example, when they're expressing affect. And we'll go into more of why he, Featherstone, uses that term. Finally, consumer culture, I think, perhaps one of the clearer ideas, that this is the culture of and around a market, you know, a place where things are bought and sold, how things, services, images are bought and sold. So our consumer culture today revolves around the way that commodities are marketed, bought, sold, etc. We can begin with a premise that in Western societies, beauty is linked with moral goodness. And you see this quite regularly, the belief that people who are attractive ought to be better 
people and good people, um, that morality is connected with certain types of images and that other types of images, for example, are less appealing and linked to lower levels of morality. With that premise, and you can read the article to see a little more of that being fleshed out, you can begin. Some of the discourses that we have today go back a long way to things like, for example, suggesting that how you look not only uh, affects how you feel, okay, and which is, that's an old idea, the way that you look affects how you feel, but also that altering your appearance can lead you to access your best self. And this is a, a notion that you might see corresponds nicely with Gottschalk's discussion of hypermodernity. I want to be clear though, you'll notice that Featherstone does not mention really much at all about modernity, postmodernity, hypermodernity. He doesn't even want to go into that discussion of uh, what era these ideas may fall under. But Gottschalk would say some of that could be connected with hypermodernity. So, uh, the idea that you can access your best self and that the self can be enhanced by altering the body's image. Another key idea here is that this is a very democratic thing today, or more democratic than it's ever been, in that you, through effort and money, which can also be earned through effort, can accomplish this. Everyone today can do it. It isn't just for elite people. So we seem to have a, a new thing happening and the extent to which we can change our body through things like, as I said, uh, money and effort is perhaps different than ever before. But Featherstone asks this question about what is the relationship between changing one's appearance leading to changing how a person feels about, or I should say, within their body. There's this maybe simple notion that, oh, you change the way you look, for example, through plastic surgery, and that leads in the direction of a certain type of feeling or affect. This is the logic of it. Do changes uh, in the inner self follow changes in appearance. Uh, to what extent do they follow them? Is it a clear correspondence? How does this relationship work? A huge part of the article. And there are some people who would say, okay, naturally if you, for example, get a facelift, you will embody uh, maybe a, a feeling of improvement, of, of greater happiness with yourself. All right. But some people would argue that just by changing some form of your physical appearance, it doesn't necessarily correspond with the personality you have, uh, maybe the emotional default settings you have. Maybe you're shy. Maybe you're introverted. It's not as if maybe looking uh, more attractive based on how you feel you ought to have looks that correspond maybe with a celebrity. If you change your looks, that may not necessarily correspond with some type of inner sense of self, okay? And that's really this component here. Do changes in the inner self naturally follow the changes of the, you, uh, your appearance? Or do you have to, to some extent, maybe become like a method actor? Do you have to learn embodiments of self-confidence, okay? What's the relationship between those two? And there's a general notion that consumer culture today is supposed to bring all of these things together, all right, in some type of relationship based on capitalism, buying and selling of things for a profit, that body style and lifestyle transformation are, as they say, all of a piece, that they work in concert together in a way that you can lead maybe toward progress, toward improvement. We'll see in a minute. So where does Featherstone think these ideas came from? He discusses the link between images, advertising, and desire. That images, advertising, and desire work together. And in particular, 
this started to appear, the logic of those working together, started to appear in the 1800s with a particular technology, the invention of photography and photographs. You could have pictures of people and those pictures, images, uh, would be connected with maybe desire and the possibility of attaining that image. Right? So you could see, for example, people with certain types of haircuts. And that would mean, oh, well, maybe if I get a bob, for example, then uh, I can attain more like that look and more maybe like that person and maybe happiness or something. Um, so these photographic images and links to those advertisements and the selling of products leads to an increased awareness of and focus on the body in consumer culture. And if you were to, for example, look at uh, fashion magazines, uh, it's replete with images of the body. And in fact, a whole lot of uh, advertising actually shows people uh, and bodies. Um, things that don't even necessarily have to do really with the products being sold. Good-looking people are associated with all kinds of products in order to make connections. So the idea here that um, these kinds of images and advertising uh, led to increased awareness of and focus on the body and consumer culture, images are connected to a larger inner and cultural narrative of how someone ought to be in the world. All right, and that's a, a wonderful thing to think about. Images connected to a larger inner personal and cultural narrative of role models and how a person ought to be in the world, the types of things they should aspire to be like, products they should have, how they should look. The rise of the still poised, or I'm sorry, try that again, posed uh, photograph in the 1800s though, didn't convey something. It doesn't convey what Featherstone refers to as presence. What's presence? It's the, as I have here, immediate physicality of a personality that's witnessed around being uh, around someone. So you know the difference between a 2D picture dimension of someone and even seeing a person in film. Featherstone talks about the rise of Hollywood film as well as photographs, but photographs coming first. The difference between those things and actually being around a real person that you get all kinds of other kinds of images, um, ideas, um, and subconscious stuff from an actual physical presence of a person. All right? So the immediate physicality of a personality that you witness in being around someone. And presence is harder to manipulate. It is an intensity beyond a contrived look. It's a feeling that's not captured through conscious thought and language. And so there's, if you will, in a real simple way, more to it uh, when you actually have presence than simply image through photograph or film. One of the things, though, that Featherstone notes, transformation is a key aspect of Western modernity. And the notion of transformation. You go back to the Enlightenment, you remember one of the key ideas is progress. So self-invention and self-betterment are also key notions in American culture. And these correspond with these new technologies that we have and new opportunities, uh, new markets that are emerging. We seemingly are more able to alter our appearance than any other previous culture. How does that correspond with American values of self-invention and self-betterment, improving yourself as a project? In the 1900s, you begin to see the emergence of Hollywood stars and celebrities. Uh, this is very different from in the past because you didn't have the emphasis on a a picture or a film image of people and that led to a whole different logic about who is seen and who can be emulated. The notion of a Hollywood star of course had to emerge out of film. 
but the idea of Hollywood stars is something that I think now is spread around the globe. People know who Brad Pitt is. Uh, people knew uh, a generation ago who Paul Newman was. That type of image uh, has been communicated around the world in a very different way than images of people could have been communicated even a hundred years earlier. So these stars and celebrities, Featherstone says, become new sources of interest and scrutiny, especially in how they look and act. And he talks about, for example, the celebrity interview. There's this funny thing where we not only want to seemingly know just about the person, but we want to know how their love life is going and feel entitled to getting that kind of personal information. And there's a corresponding idea that personalities who are in the spotlight have to learn how to do that type of revelation with the media in particular kinds of ways so that there's a negotiation where we may not really get all of the person, but we get this kind of a canned personality, if you will, or managed personality. And the funny thing is, is that um, in the past, you could say uh, women have been disproportionately scrutinized through photographic and film images in the past, but that now we may be entering into a more um, heavier scrutiny of males as well. People have talked about the uh, commodification of male images too, and you see this through um, various types of, of terms uh, that have come about, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a, in a bit. Today you have uh, cosmetical, I'm sorry, cosmetic, ah, having trouble today, cosmetic surgical techniques that are available to people. Uh, the biggest one you can think of, plastic surgery uh, will allow for all kinds of different enhancements. Um, it can be um, the idea of, of leg implants, uh, implants in different parts of the body to make them appear bigger, uh, facial surgery of all kinds, and body modification and augmentations like, for example, too, uh, you can even add a height today through surgically extending legs. What they do is they cut into the leg, they stretch it out, and they add a metal pin. Uh, so the options we have today for changing our physical appearance are amazing. Um, and that um, Featherstone points out that there are many reality shows that are now being made about the transformational process for people who undergo different types of surgery or intensive weight loss programs. So if you watch something like Extreme Body Makeover or Nip and Tuck, you're seeing maybe a, a physical change in a person, how that affects them emotionally, and then in terms of maybe their personality, this tracking of someone over time to see how these changes occur in uh, conjunction or concert. Um, as I said before, um, cosmetic surgery can be used also to perhaps change uh, things like um, how men look and, and increasing scrutiny of males. Uh, you have the rise of the metrosexual. I, that was uh, a term for maybe a, a male who's overly involved in uh, his own appearance to, to the extent that uh, women may have been in the past. Cosmetic surgery is also not just used for physical enhancement, but to alter, reduce, eliminate the effects of aging. And there are extreme examples of cosmetic surgery, which you can Google online. And I, I think that if you want to Google uh, Orlan, you can look up her various surgeries. Some of them are on, I believe, YouTube. Uh, her attempts to completely transform herself in terms of ideals of beauty and to some extent how this has really failed, that, that she has not been able to become the most beautiful woman in the world by taking on, for example, characteristics of Mona Lisa, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, all these different people, the best characteristics they had, and blend them into one person. So Orlan is one example of extreme cosmetic surgery. She's undergone uh, dozens, as I understand it, of these surgeries. And uh, Lola Ferrari, uh, who had the largest breast augmentation uh, ever at one point and died in her 19, uh, died in her 30s, I believe it was. Um, this is a belief that is corresponding with cosmetic surgery promoting an aesthetic healing that you can reverse uh, the um, wrinkles of of the of that come with age 
the ruin that aging brings to the body and the face. The second half of the Featherstone article, though, checks to see uh, whether or not, you know, this rather simplistic idea of, okay, the body can be changed or modified based on uh, options today, and that will lead to, for example, an improved sense of self or more happiness, that he says uh, is critiquable, and he does so in the latter half. So as an example of this, um, plastic surgery for some people, does not seem to lead to uh, self-satisfaction, as you would think it would if you have that model I just mentioned. But it leads to, for some, again, an intensified self-scrutiny. So like, for example, Michael Jackson has surgery after surgery because there are new faults to be found. And it, it also means that maybe the sense of self that the person was hoping would be changed after the surgery isn't in fact changed. You know, there's some underlying core self and underlying beliefs about that person that they can't ever really fully alter. It isn't like a mechanical relationship. One form of alteration automatically does something to the other part. Um, and there are other effects of cosmetic surgery. Here's an example. If you have Botox injections in parts of your face, uh, that leads to um, an inability at times to move facial muscles. Uh, Botox causes paralysis of parts of the face. And so what happens is that this supposed Im improvement in the image uh, of the face, the smoothing of the wrinkles, actually comes at another cost where you have a decline in your ability to express emotions. And so that relates back to that notion of presence. Okay, You might be able to alter the physicality of your face that you could see in a photograph if someone were to take a photograph of you. But if you're actually around that person in their physical presence and seeing them move, you begin to realize, oh, there's something not quite right. And people then might take a whole opposite kind of view of this to say, oh, this person was so vain to think that they could improve themselves and there's a hyper scrutiny of those people who get cosmetic surgery that seems to be the absolute reverse of what the people intended to have happen when they got the surgery. They think, oh, I'll look better, I'll look fresher, more improved. When they have those things happen, then people will say, oh, they seem more fake, um, they seem less uh, human. So the article suggests that how we think about our bodies today is not simple. It occurs on a number of different levels and we in social theory need to think through that and in order to do that uh, Featherstone discusses a, a simplistic dualism. You can have the body without image okay, and that really is the, the idea of um, lived in in habitual ways, okay, how you comport yourself every day and that it's not constantly subjected to, as it says here, the quote, the instrumental gaze of the consumer culture, I believe the quote ends, technician. So that we live, again, and, and embody a, a presence, and that's different from our image. And there's a discussion in his piece of Ronald Reagan, so that uh, Reagan is seen as having a lot of gaffes in the way that he would present himself and speak, um, but yet he had a very sonorous voice and he was an actor so that he could appear in a way to have um, a presence that was um, also different from the way that he would sometimes stumble in his communication. So we have a lot of different ways to think about bodies and images. You can have the, the body without image, okay, and that uh, often the body as image is a static kind of thing. You see it in film or you see it in a, a picture, okay? A still photo. But the body in motion, again that presence, gives rise to a 
body without an image, a feeling that we have that there's more to the person than simply some type of basic visual information we can get from film or still photography. Featherstone cites Brian Masumi's work, who is another theorist, and Masumi's discussion of the, quote, primacy of the affective in image reception. So, again, to think about the word affect, that's related to feelings, uh, the ability to move us, as it says in the article. So, image reception uh, and its ability to affect, move us. And the work of two video artists, Bill Viola and Douglas Gordon. And what Featherstone does with those two is he says they're people who, um, in the Bill Viola uh, example, he has uh, images of a person experiencing an emotion from different angles that he shows in art galleries at super slow rates of speed. In addition, uh, Douglas Gordon has this thing, I think it's called a 24 hour psycho, where the film is of the film Psycho, but it's slowed to such an extent that you get to be able to see image and image change in a way that is more revealing of the body without image. That video art may give us a little bit of insight into the body without image ideas that we have running in our subconscious that are not uh, communicable in language. So these artists I'd like you to know are able to reveal to us how much of the information that we gain from other people really comes from subconscious assessment, from things that are uh, not really uh, apparent to us. And Featherstone says that this type of new technology in, in film art is opening up new aesthetic perceptions for us. We could never have seen those kinds of things in that way a hundred years ago. But now, especially through digital media, we're able to, and he says this opens up a whole new way of, of thinking about affect and also potentially even new worlds. Um, as an analogy, you could think maybe of how the microscope opened up a new world of seeing germs and uh, microscopic biological things uh, that um, microbes that would be unseeable by the naked eye. So how is it that these things are going to open up new ways of thinking about what it is to be human and understandings of how humans are and think? So finally, uh, Featherstone is arguing that we as social theorists need to move between registers or consider more than simply the commodification of the body image. That's oversimplifying the role of the body, affect, and image today in how we theorize these things. People recognize there's an interplay between body image and the lived experience inside a body. So it isn't the simplistic kind of thing of, okay, you can change these things and people won't notice. There might also be an underlying personality shining through that has other qualities to it. Uh, there aren't sort of mechanical relationships here. There's a lot of interpretation and subconscious awareness that we also pick up on. Those are the registers that Featherstone is talking about. It's over, overly simple to suggest that people care most about body image and uh, that think uh, changing can fully alter one's presence. Uh, changing that is not going to alter in some ways the presence of people. Today we need to move back and forth is ultimately Featherstone's final point. We need to consider body image and body without image in a relationship to each other.